and welcome to High School Physics Explained. Have you ever walked around in the dark with a torch and discovered that if you shine the torch close to your feet, the ground appears quite bright? But as soon as you shine your torch at a further distance, the amount of light that you get is significantly less. In other words, the drop off of light reflecting on the ground drops off significantly the further away you are from that spot. What about looking at the sun? Now, the sun is, of course, particularly bright. But if we were to imagine what the sun would look like on different planets, such as on Mercury, on Mars, on Saturn, on Neptune, and on Pluto, then the sun will get significantly dimmer, quite a lot dimmer. Even though the energy is the same for all six situations, the actual brightness drops off significantly simply because you are further away. What is the relationship between the intensity of light that you get and the distance. Well, that is leading us to the concept of the inverse square law. Now in your class, your teacher may ask you to perform an experiment which examines the inverse squared law. And the setup is very simple. You have a data logger connected to a computer and you have a light sensor that you're able to move towards a particular light source. And so this data logger is able to in measure the intensity of light. And so that you may design an experiment where you may start off at two centimeters and record the intensity of light that you get. You continue the process at measuring at set intervals. So let's say at four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14 centimeters and you record the values of the intensity for each of those distances. What could you expect to get when you graph the results? Well, let's have a look at what you would get. So we would record distance and intensity. Distance being our independent variable and intensity being our dependent variable. And so we're going to do for centimeters at two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14. And let's say you started at an arbitrary value of an intensity of a thousand units. You subsequently get 250, 111, 63, 40, 28, and 20. And then you did some analysis with the data and you got a graph that looks like this. And then if you did the analysis, you would discover that the relationship between the intensity and distance was such that the intensity is proportional to one over the distance squared. In other words, you would find that as you double the distance, the intensity drops by not that factor of two downwards, but by a square of that. So in other words, four times smaller. If you triple the distance, then the intensity drops not by a factor of three, but drops by a factor of three squared or nine. But the question remains, why is that relationship true? Well, in order to explore that, let's discuss what brightness is all about. So here I have a light source, and that light source is giving off a certain amount of energy. Let's look at energy per second, and so what we want is energy per time, and so that is going to be power. So in other words, this, this light bulb, or whatever this light source is, has a certain power output. It consistently gives out that value no matter where you look it from. But let's say now we put a sphere around this bulb. This sphere is now receiving the light on the inner surface of this sphere. What is the brightness at every single point on that sphere? Well, clearly this whole amount of energy is being spread out over the surface area of the sphere. And so the intensity in this case is simply equal to the power divided by the area of this sphere, which is going to be four pi r squared. And so in this case, the intensity is going to be related to the radius of an r value like so. And so we may have, in this case, the intensity number one, let's say intensity here for the orange color, is equal to the power, which of course is constant, over four pi r squared. But imagine now the sphere being 
twice as big. Now, of course, we have an intensity based on not on a radius of r, but a radius, in this case, of 2r. Although the power output is exactly the same, the intensity will be equal to the same power over 4 pi. Now, the radius is now 2r, all squared. Now, if you did the mathematics in that situation, the intensity, of course, now is equal to the same power divided by not 4 pi r squared, but 16 pi r squared. The result is intensity here is one quarter of the intensity at this junction over here. So now let's say we don't have 2r, but we have 3r. We have now a radius here of 3r, and the intensity, of course, is equal exactly to the same power output divided by 4 pi r squared. Now, r is, of course, 3r all squared, and so you end up getting power is equal to 36 pi r squared. When you compare that to our original value, you can see that this in new intensity here is one ninth of this intensity over here. So as your area of the sphere increases, the amount of light per given area drops by a factor that is the square of the factor that you're changing the radius by. So there you have it. That is, in essence, inverse square formula. So let's put that together. As I stated earlier, the intensity is proportional to 1 over the distance squared. If we therefore use symbols, we say i is proportional to 1 over d squared. But often, a very useful way of writing the inverse square law is by examining the various intensities from two different distances in relation to the same object with the same energy output. And so what you do is you say this. You say the intensity of the second position divided by the intensity of the first position is equal to the distance of the first position squared divided by the distance of the second squared. You'll notice that the number subscript, the two subscript, is one's on the numerator here and one's on the denominator. So how does this play out? And the best way to do this is to look at an example. A light bulb is receiving at a certain distance an intensity of 10 units when measured at 5 centimeters from the source. If measured again at 12 centimeters, what is its new intensity? Well, what we'd first do, of course, is write down the variables we know and don't know. So intensity 2 is the thing we're looking for, whereas intensity 1, of course, is the value of 10. Distance 2, in this case, is 12 centimeters, whereas distance 1 is equal to 5 centimeters. We now, of course, substitute those things in into our formula here. And so what we get is intensity 2 divided by intensity 1, and that, of course, is equal to 10, is equal to, now, distance 1, of course, is 5, and our distance 2 is 12, but of course we have to square both of them. And so what we get is that intensity 2 ends up being 10 multiplied by 25 divided by 144, which gives us a total of 1.74 units. And I've done that, of course, to three significant digits in this case. So as you can see, we have a significant drop-off by almost increasing the distance by a factor of 2.5, almost, you can see we have a more, much more significant drop in intensity. Now the inverse square law doesn't just play out in terms of light, but it plays out in a number of other areas of physics as well. For example, Isaac Newton developed the gravitational law, which is equal to g m1 m2 over d squared. So there is an example where we have an inverse square law, where the force is inversely proportional to the distance squared. Another example 
is the force in terms of Coulomb's forces, that is the force between charges. And similarly, the formula is C Q1 Q2 over D squared. Again, the force of attraction or repulsion between charges is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. It works with sound as well, as long as you understand we're talking specifically about sound intensity. Well, I hope that has helped you understand a little bit about the inverse square law. Please like, share and subscribe. My name is Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.